Uh, let's bring on Keith Pompey from the Philadelphia Inquirer somewhere out on the West Coast watching the Sixers. Keith, how you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. What about you? Well, Jeff's just waiting for what you're going to say, so he's hesitant to say anything, but I'm doing well. Hey, yeah. you know what I, know what I was going to say? <laughs> <laughs> What yeah, get squad, ahead. Yeah. I'll stay quiet. Huh? What happened? Uh, no, go ahead. We're, there, there. We're here. Go ahead. Jason. I'll stay quiet. <laughs> Jason, Jason, Rutgers could have been there for that, right? They could have. They could have. They broke yeah. my heart. Yeah. I stayed up late, um, but they could have done what Michigan did. <laughs> yeah, anybody could have. Pitt, Pitt could have pulled a Michigan. <laughs> So that's the funny thing. I said to Jeff, what are you going to say to Keith when he comes on and like rips Michigan? He goes, what am I going to say? Rip his school? It's my own school. He's got no response to you, yeah. Keith. Yeah. You're, you know, you, you are I, literally I couldn't tell the difference. I, I couldn't tell the difference from Michigan to Pitt last, last yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't Jeff. tell. <laughs> you're, you're literally Teflon to me because, because you can rip on Michigan every time you come on the show. And I can't sit there and, and, and give a hard time to your alma mater because it's also mine. <laughs> yeah, well, you can, you can make fun of my high school. We, we're no longer around, but we did win the last basketball championship. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff's going to have to there. dig. Jeff's going to have to dig deep for you. All right, Keith. So you're out there in L.A. Uh, it's it's mm-hmm. funny. I think I saw the Sixers practicing at UCLA today while UCLA is about to play here at the Wells Fargo Center tonight. Uh, tell us about mm-hmm. what the feeling is after the Lakers win and then what's going on with this team out there on the West Coast. You know, it's funny because it, the, the feeling was, it's like, oh, we, we got one. It, it wasn't it wasn't pretty. It wasn't uh, one of our most memorable victories, but we went in there and we got a win. You know, tonight is, is, is kind of different because, you know, Doc Rivers had a lot of success with um, – um, you know, with the Clippers, you know, right, he's the all-time winning his coach in regards to winning percentage and everything like that with the, with the franchise. So this is kind of like a homecoming. You know, last year there wasn't any fans in there or very few fans just because of the pandemic. So, you know, this is kind of like a storyline here, and, and we'll see how the fans react to him, see, you know, things like that. But, again, you know, the Sixers, they have to keep pace. You know, here's a team that uh, is, is losing games, talking about the Clippers, but the Sixers are a game and a half out of first place. Um, I, I think, and if they lose, they could drop from third to what, fourth. So it's one of those things where, you know, the Sixers, they got to be locked in and they know they have to play well to, to win not only today, but try to get a victory, an upset victory on Sunday against Phoenix. You know, Keith, you mentioned that they're only a game and a half out of first place. So, yes, I know that the, that it actually worked out. But what people are wondering is, what were the Sixers thinking, playing the number one seed only a couple games out and sitting their two best players? You know, <laughs> you know, it's one of the things that I think with James, you know, it's a matter of they don't want him playing back to back because of the hamstring, right? Um, secondly, with Joel, it was a matter of everybody always thought that he was going to miss the game. But you would prefer for him to miss the first one as opposed to the game on the tail end of a back-to-back, right? Um, especially right. that one. But it would look to me that, hey, well, we're probably going to lose this one anyway. Uh, we, we might as well just rest our guy. You know, one of those things. But, um, yeah, it, it was it – was, I'm not going to say bizarre, you know, let, let's be honest. Like this, I did say that the 76ers are a game and a half out of first, but it also makes you wonder that the road would be a whole lot easier if they finish, what, third or fourth, you know what I mean? So it could be one of those things where, I mean, I'm not saying it, but, you know, it, it's like they, they keep saying it's not about winning, it's about being healthy. But sometimes you got to question, well, when are they the games they're focusing on being healthy, <laughs> you know, in, you know what I mean? Because it just seems like that was the wrong game uh, from a health standpoint to rest players, knowing that it was a vital game. I was just surprised that they didn't stagger the days off. I, I really thought that that was going to be their plan going down the stretch is to give one a night off so that you still have one in the game. But you mentioned the road ahead. 
This team this year, in past years, they've been dominant at home, and it's the road they've struggled. They're 24 and 11 on the road, one of the best teams out there. What is it about this team getting out on the road that's different than when they're playing at home some nights? You know, I think that it's like the guys kind of, the fact that they get along now, the fact that it's kind of like a circle of the wagon thing. And if you notice, when they go out on the road now, it's like Joel B goes out to dinner with them. They do a lot of team building things. And I think, like, they're just a closer, closer-knit closer team on the road and, and than they were in the past. Now, again, at home, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, guys, you come home, you go, you go to shoot around, you go home, you do a lot of different things. They're just not together as much as, as one would assume just because of other obligations. But, you know, I do feel like it's one of those circle the wagon things when they go on the road. They just come through with adversity. Now, we, we also have to be honest with ourselves and some of these games that they were playing early on, at least in the road, it wasn't a lot of the stiff competition. A lot of their stiff competition came at home early on. You know, like Brooklyn was at home. Milwaukee was at home. You know, uh, teams like that. So I think it's starting to balance out a little bit. I do think the Sixers have improved. But I do think that that had a, a huge factor in their success. A, they circled the wagon. And B, you know, a lot of their stiffest competition you know, was at home at, at, at a certain point in time. You know, you mentioned Joel Embiid going out with the team for dinner and things like that. There seems to have been over the last year, year and a half, the, this enlightenment of Joel Embiid. Uh, what have you noticed about the change in Joel Embiid or the maturation of Joel Embiid as, as both a person and a leader over the, the last couple of years? You know, I, I think it comes down to, you know, right now he knows that he is the, the, the leader of the team. I mean, he is the, he doesn't have to compete against someone else um, to be that guy. Now, it could be something like later on with him and James Harden, but I think it's a little different just because James is older. James has been there before. You know, he's been the focal point. And I, I think that when it was Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, they both were they both were like battling to be the guy. And then you know another thing is I, I feel like you know Joel is is comfortable. Like he, and what I mean by comfortable is, you know, here's a guy who has um, a, a great contract. He just signed an extension that's going to kick in soon for 198 million dollars. You know he he's um, he has a, a fiance that he. He loves dearly, and you expect him to, right? That's his fiance. They they have a young son, and you know Joel isn't. He's the type of guy who basically that's his life, being around family. He knows he's going to be secure financially, and he knows he's going to be a seventy sixer. So I feel like, you know, he's more comfortable now. He knows that this is his team. You know, he he's not competing against anyone. But early on, I felt like he and Ben Simmons competed against each other to see who was going to be the man. <laughs> Excuse me, y'all. You know, you mentioned James Harden, and I'm curious what you're seeing for his fit both on and off the court. It seems like as much as his play is scrutinized on the court, he's kind of coaching up some of the other players. This team is 9-3 and three with him in the lineup, and the stat that, that I found more amazing, they score almost 17 more points a game per 100 possessions, 120, than when he's not in the game. And Danny Green, Tobias Harris, Thibel, and Embiid are shooting 41.5% from three-point range with him on the floor, just 21% without him on there. Can you talk about James Harden's impact? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it has a lot to do with not having a point guard. You know, as much as we love Tyrese Maxey and he's having a, a heck of a season, um, he's more of a two guard or a combo guard at best. And they didn't have a point guard. The backup point guard was Shake Milton. So you look at it and you see a guy, and I'm not saying that, you know, James is a traditional point guard, but you see a guy with a high basketball IQ who's right now trying to, you know, get teammates established and, and get them open shots. And it basically tells you all year we kept saying, hey, this team needs a point guard. Well, this is what you get when you get one. 
Um, you know, and I think the reason why a lot of people have been really shocked by it is because they thought that he was going to come in here and we were going to see a lot of ISO James. But right now it's one of those things where he sees what Joel Embiid is doing. He sees a lot of what, you know, what George Niang is doing, Tyrese Maxey. So he, his goal is he wants to fit in. He's still bothered by that hamstring a little bit. And he just wants to go out there and he wants to play well and, and he and he just wants to um get his make his teammates better. So that's the thing. Now when you say off the court, um, you know, I, I'm assuming you're talking about as far as the leadership ability he has. And, you know, when it's funny because, you know, first time Court Miles described it, he says, Look, you have two types of superstar players. You have the superstar player who basically shows up and he plays, and he's not really around teammates. But then you have the other one who comes here, and he wants to make everyone better. And that's who James is. He's here, and he's, like, talking to Maxie, challenging him, challenging George Niang, Matisse Spiebel, all these other guys. He's challenging them to put in work and do what they have to do. So when you hear something like that, um, you know, when you hear that, that lets you know exactly um, why this team is being better because James is like, you know, helping out. I mean, the, a good example after the the first home shoot around, James was teaching Joel his step back move. Now everyone has a step back, but James looks distinctly different than everyone else's. So it was, it was Joel, Sam Cassell, and James. And Joel kept traveling, <laughs> but James actually took time to teach this seven foot two dude his patented move, and that's a sign of a leader right there, you know. So here, here's my big concern from watching, especially with the Raptors game. What are the Sixers going to do if they face a big lineup? You have Joel Embiid, then your power forward is Tobias Harris, who's struggling right now. But they got out rebounded by a team that was not that much bigger than them in any way by a lot in Toronto. And you've seen that time and time again, that the Sixers do not seem to get a ton of rebounds. What is going on or am I seeing it wrong? You know, I think that when they go against these, you're talking about these big guys, like, like a team like Toronto, I just think that they don't have the size or the athleticism. You know what I mean? You know, it's, it's, it's just a mismatch problem. I mean, if you look at the 76ers right now, you look at DeAndre Jordan, you know, a great locker room guy, but he may be a little bit past this prom, right? You look at, um, what's his a name, little. Paul Millsap. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> you look at Paul Millsap. Now, here's the thing about – here's the thing about – you just sound like me like coming 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 at Jeff right now. Right? So you you look at you look at Paul Millsap, right? You know, they got him playing center when he's actually a four and he's thirty seven years old, right? You know what I mean? Right. So not only is he older, you have him playing out of position. But then for the most part, like they don't have like their best players on his team for the outside of Joel and B. I mean, are are like stretch fours or guards. And George Niang, you know, he, he, they list him as like six eight, six nine. I mean, he's he's not that big of a guy. They can't match up with these teams. I mean, they can't match up against athletic guys. Excuse me, athletic teams with a lot of length. You know, like you go out there, and, and they, the Sixers are just basically. Um, you know, they're, they're just too small and not athletic enough, and, and, and that's a problem. I mean, you look at uh, Toronto, I mean, is a re- and then I hate this, Nick Nurse is a hell, hell of a coach. You know, he's been getting the, he's been divide, um, the, uh, coming up with defenses to stop Joel Embiid since Joel Embiid's been in the league. So, you know, it's just a bad matchup in, in, in Toronto, they, you know, a bunch of six eight to six ten guys who can play multiple positions. They can play anywhere from like the three to the five, and they got like four or five of them who can do that. 
So that's just tough for the 76ers. It, it, I think that's more of a roster problem than it is a coaching standpoint problem. It's like they just don't have the roster to match up against them. I just wanted to ask you about some of the other teams that they could end up facing. They all seem to have their own issues. Brooklyn, you know, who's playing, who isn't. New York will obviously change, so Kyrie can play there. In Miami, you see, and I know that this is overblown at times, but Jimmy Butler and Udonis Haslam getting into it on the bench. Uh, what is the state of the other teams that we should be looking out for now, along with the Sixers coming down the stretch? Well, I don't think that thing with Jimmy Butler and Udonis Haslam was overblown at all. Like, I mean, I know they, they say that after the fact, and they, oh, this happens all the time, but I don't think we've, we've seen it. <laughs> I mean, if it happened all the time, it wouldn't have been all over the news, right? It wouldn't have been all over social media. Um, I think they have a problem right now with frustration. You know, Jimmy was a 76er. We know about him. We know that he gets frustrated. We know that he challenges people. But the way the way the way that whole thing looked, it was a bad look. And you look at it, here's a team that's number one in the East. It's a team where players have been struggling, you know, shooting percentage wise individually since the All Star break, including Jimmy Butler. So I think that's frustration. It's, emb- it's an embarrassment to them to go and lose to the Seventy Sixers without Joel and B and James Harden. So I think that's where Brooklyn. I mean, excuse me. Miami is they're frustrated. And when you look at a team like Brooklyn, that's a team that's on the 76ers I want no parts of. I do not want to play Brooklyn, right? Um, I, 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 but the thing about Brooklyn is I don't know if Brooklyn is going to be able to beat Toronto in the play-in game. So it, with that being said, I look at Brooklyn probably being the number eight seed. And the reason why I'm saying that is because Kyrie, although he's cleared to play, in New York, you, you unvaccinated players cannot play in Toronto. So I in, in that game, the way it looks at right now, that that seven eight game would would be in in Toronto. So I don't see uh, you know um, Kyrie playing. But as far as like uh, Brooklyn, KD, you have Kyrie. I mean, I know Ben Simmons isn't playing. But I just don't see anybody on the 76ers being able to stop those two guys. I just don't wow. see it. And then with the with the addition of Drummond. Now, another team, if I'm the 76ers, I'm a little leery of, is Boston. Because for a while, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum were each other's worst enemy. It was kind of like iso ball. Like, now nah, I'm coming down, I'm shooting. And uh, I'm not passing you the ball. You're on the other side. I'm coming down shooting. These two guys have figured out how to play with each other. And then they have, you know, other guys who are just gritty and play hard, tough nose. You look at Al Horford. He was a, a disaster in Philly. But he's one of the best guys in regards to defending Joel Embiid. So there are three teams that if I'm the 76ers, I do not want to see early on in the playoffs in the first round, and that's Brooklyn, Toronto, or the Boston Celtics. You know, I'll, I'll take I'll take Chicago, I'll take Cleveland, but those other three teams, I don't want any parts of them if I'm the 76ers. All right, well, we, we know that you have to go because we're cutting into your rollerblading on Malibu beach time, but before we let you go, is there anybody that we haven't seen in the rotation in the last five games or so that's going to break into this rotation before the playoffs start? That you haven't seen? Nah, I don't yeah, see it. It's, it seems like we're down I mean, to eight guys. I don't know. But my thing is, like, you know, right now they got Jordan, right? I mean, a lot of people would love to see Charles Bassey. They would love to see uh, Paul Reed. But it just seems as if that Doc has more faith in, in, in the veteran guys, you know. And, and like, to me, if, if these guys aren't getting any experience and learning right now, it's hard to throw a Charles Bassey and a, a Paul Reed into a meaningful playoff game where the stakes are high if you don't even want to play them in a regular season. Isn't you know, that so why I they should be getting time now, though? to give them the option 
to have that experience if they need them in the postseason. It just puzzles me this, this, that, that they're not taking the chance. Yeah, I think the the problem is like right now it's probably even still too late if you want to be honest with yourself. I feel like in order for them to get those get get the confidence up and and play at an extremely high level, it's like they should have been playing all season. You know, I mean, I mean the same thing with Isaiah Joe. You look at Isaiah Joe, and you know, yeah, he's getting a little bit of minutes now, but he's making like <laughs> excuse me, early season mistakes in late critical games, which leads to his minutes being cut short abruptly sometimes, right? So to me, it's like one of those things where you look at it and you have to say to yourself, like, you know, you these are the type of guys that you have to play them throughout. I mean, you know, Tyrese Maxey, last year he didn't get a lot of minutes that we thought, you know, just so happens that, Guys were messing up, and the Sixers threw him in there, and he played well, you know. But and, and it just so happens that Ben Simmons didn't refuse to play for the Sixers, so now we got to see what he can do. But it, it was a point in time, like early in the season last year, you had Tyrese Maxey, and then Isaiah Joe was like right behind him. Not only was he knocking down shots, he was doing a solid job of defending, and then all of a sudden. He just stopped playing. So to me, yes, we can throw him out there, but I also think that these games are so meaningful right now that, and, and, and they're so far behind in, re, in regards to playing, getting uh, consistent playing time that, you know, a couple possessions here and there of mistakes would doom the Sixers. So I think that, you know, and, and Doc, you know, he says that this isn't the case. But, you know, everyone I talk to and the stuff that I'm seeing now seems to tend to make you uh, think that he doesn't have a lot of faith in young players. He likes that. Yeah. that that's, that's what it looks like from here. Look, Keith, we, we look forward to following you, reading you in the Inquirer, checking you out at Pompeii on Sixers. I know Jeff won't stay up to the game for the game tonight, so he'll catch you locked on Sixers tomorrow. Plus, you uh, gotta you gotta catch Keith's surf page because I'm sure he's going out surfing after this too. Yeah, Yo, just you, you guys about... want to know how I spent my off day yesterday? <laughs> yes, I, w- I woke up at one thirty in the afternoon. Like I went, you know, woke up at one thirty in the afternoon. Then uh, my my cousin came over. I had like dinner with her, and then around eight o'clock at night, I was back in the bed. Like seriously, sure. dude. You know, I, I I'm like the most boring person on the road. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, like, think, I think we I'm need a live boring. show of Keith Pompey moving from bed to food to bed. He's the, he's the DeAndre yeah. Jordan of reporters. <laughs> oh, Keith, he found a way to take a shot at the end. Keith, you take care of yourself, yeah. man. Thanks so much for the time. Go little blue. Go little blue. Oh, <laughs> Talk to you later, man. Goodbye, Keith. Bye. Bye. <laughs>